Welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is produced by Ombrex, which connects you with the world's top independent management consultants. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm so excited to be here today with John Rennie, a former nuclear trained submarine officer and who has been a leader at multiple manufacturing companies and is also the author of I Have the Watch, filled with leadership lessons from his time in the Navy and in corporate America. John, thanks so much for coming on the show. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on you know, leadership t- here in the time of the coronavirus. What, what are some of the, the kind of the key, the key um, things for leaders to keep in mind? Hi, Will. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, we're in the midst of a crisis and we're dealing with things that we've never dealt with before. And um, I run a manufacturing business called Peak Demand down here in North Carolina, and we are operational right now. So, uh, but we're dealing with, uh, you know, concerns with health and, and the welfare of our employees. So it's been kind of a unique world. We've been trying to watch what's happening with, um, you know, with our industry and, 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 you know, whether or not orders are going to slow, but we've also been trying to keep everybody safe as we're responding to our customer requests. So it's an interesting time. But, you know, the one thing I'll always say is that where there's crisis, there's opportunity. And so we, at least in our company, we've been looking for ways that we can help our customer base. You know, for example, uh, a lot of our, a lot of the technical people inside of electric utilities around the country, they go to these meter schools and there was a bunch of them that are held in the early part of the year. Well, all those got canceled. So what we've been doing is we've been providing virtual meter schools for all of our customers and and the customers, the technical people really like that. So it's a way that we can sort of continue life as normal, but doing it in a virtual way. And that's been pretty helpful. So Peak Demand, you manufacture electrical transmission and distribution components. Tell us, give us a little kind of a virtual tour of your factory and, and what sorts of steps you've had to take to keep people safe here during the pandemic. Sure. Yes, we're a designer and manufacturer of uh, electrical products, products that are used by utilities on the distribution side and also the transmission side. And uh, during this crisis, of course, the electrical utilities have to continue providing power. So we're considered a critical uh, manufacturing business. So we've stayed in operation. But that, of course, provided a challenge. Uh, How do we keep our employees safe, our people safe uh, during this time. And so it's just, a, you know, provided a couple of unique challenges. One is just how do we keep the uh, facility clean? And so we've been doing before and after uh, uh, shifts, we've been wiping down everything with uh, Lysol and disinfecting and, you know, um, you know, doorknobs and any, any, any door, anything where people were touched, we're cleaning that. We're doing social distancing, making sure that everybody stays uh, far apart. And I think we've been we've been really sensitive towards spe- the special needs of our employees during this time. For example, we have some employees whose spouses are in the medical industry and they've had to change to certain shift work. And so we've been able to do flexible hours with our employees as they've needed it um, during this time as well. So it's just a, been a matter of good housekeeping, social distancing and um, being flexible, um, you know, during this time. And I think the other thing is. I personally, from a leadership standpoint, have been spending a lot of time with my employees, making sure that they're okay at home and they're they're you know they're able to handle um, you know what's going on with their families and making sure they have everything they need as well. I mean, just as an example, I was able to commercially buy toilet paper, and so I bought uh, a, a number of cases of uh, toilet paper, and I just gave it to my employees. I said, "Take what you need." You know, we'll buy more um, if if you need it. So, I think just trying to be there for for our employees during this time as well. That is awesome. Tell tell me a little bit more, like other kinds of examples like that. The uh, and, and I I saw how you I think you uh, you know you, you mentioned about the you know, buying buying just needed supplies like toilet paper that might not be available in stores. What are some other things that that you've done? Yeah, I think. Um, well, one of the things I've talked about a lot, um, you know, I do, I, I talk a lot about leadership on on my Twitter page and uh, in articles I've been writing. And I've been talking about the importance of face-to-face communication during this time, because 
you know, in a crisis, um, people look to their leaders for a shelter, right? They look for for their leaders for answers, like a lighthouse, right, in a storm. And I think that, um, you know, what I've been trying to do is just be that uh, that lighthouse, that shelter for my employees, right? So I don't necessarily have all the answers. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week. Um, but But I've been trying to kind of be you know, keep calm during this time, right? And not panic, but also be authentic with my communication. So making sure they they know that, yes, I don't, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know, right? Um, what's going to happen with uh, with our industry? Well, I don't know, but here's what I'm seeing so far, right? And just being able to answer those questions and be uh, authentic, but also be calm during this time. So I've really tried to spend an extra amount of time with my employees. I spend time on the shop floor just, asking how things are going, you know, or, you know, how's, how, how are their children? Cause a lot of, a lot of them, you know, their, their children are home now and they're trying to do homeschooling. So I just try to be that uh, empathetic leader. Uh, and I've kind of turned that on and, you know, I kind of turbocharged that during this crisis. Cause I know, you know, there's an, a lot of, uh, you know, people are unsettled right now. And I think having, having a boss who cares about them and is looking out for them, I think is, um, I think they need that right now. So I'm trying to be that boss. Yeah. What sorts of, when you, when you have those conversations, what sorts of things are you hearing from people? Well, I think to be honest, the, the, the concerns seem to be, you know, uh, easing a bit. We've kind of gotten into this new normal now, but yeah, there was a, it was pretty scary there for a bit. We didn't know, uh, for example, if we would be shut down and we would have to lay off employees, we didn't know uh, if uh, the utilities would just stop, purchasing product and we would, you know, we would go dark for, you know, six, eight months. We, we really are six, eight weeks. We didn't really know what, how, how this was going to affect our business. So there was a lot of um, angst and concern in the early days, but I think we're kind of settling into a routine now where we're, you know, we're, we're definitely not the same as we used to be. We're being a lot more flexible with employee hours. Um, and, um, you know, well, we've had some employees where they're, they're, They've they've had to take time to, for their children to get set up and and or their spouses to get set up from home and you know they've had to had extra had had to take extra time off so we've just tried to be there and to make sure that they can do what they need to do to get set up because if they're settled at home then they can come here and be much more effective as employees right yeah and um, in a manufacturing facility have are folks wearing you know masks other kinds of ppe gloves that kind of thing yeah so um that's really up to the employee's choice we have a couple employees that that are wearing masks um and then we we do have masks available for everybody so in case they want them and we are supplying gloves and so there are a couple employees wearing gloves as well but um all that's available but it's a i would say a volunteer use right now mm -hmm. And then I imagine you, you know, how are, are you kind of doing any kind of uh, temperature checks or other kind of screening employees or, or you know, making plans if someone tests test positive, like dealing, how you'd, you know, respond to that? Yeah, no. So we've, we've, we've thought through that process if someone does, um, you know, get sick. But um, so what, uh, no, we're not taking temperature, but we are, um, we, you know, we, everybody is sort of, on high alert to see if any, you know, if they have any symptoms or what have you. We had one of our employee, um, it was on a Friday and um, he, uh, and over the weekend he, he, he was starting to get sick. Well, what it was, it was allergies as it turned out, but he just called me right away and we were going to shut down Monday until we knew what was going on. And it turns, it turned out it was allergies, but so we're sort of, everybody is kind of really super sensitive right now and just on high alert for any sort of, cough or you know any any sort of sign that there's some something wrong so we're we're, we're on kind of eggshells right now so mm -hmm. yeah so let's talk about your book a little bit you um you were in the navy about, about the same time as me and then yes. uh, you've had a uh, a series of jobs at uh, a lot of industrial companies including uh, abb where my, my dad actually worked for abb as a oh wow yeah and um uh, leading leading operations. What what um, what led you to read, write the book about leadership? Yeah, that's a good question. I um, you know I did five years in the Navy as a submarine officer, and then uh, I got out and, and 
I went right into uh, working in this space in supplying products to uh, electric utilities. So I worked in corporate America for 22 years and I led, I led eight different manufacturing plants during that time. And um, I, I think at this point in my life, I started my own company you know, five years ago, I started my own manufacturing company. But I think at this point in my life, I feel like I wanna pass on the wisdom. I wanna teach people um, things I've seen, things I've, I've observed. I mean, one of the things that you see and the statistics show it that still we've got about 70% of employees around the country that are disengaged at work, right? That they're, that they're not plugged in, they're not working, they're not giving 100, 100% to their, their companies. And so I, I really felt like, um, you know, I, I have seen some of the reasons why that is. I've seen, you know, the leadership that exists in corporate America and it's, and it's poor at best. And um, so I think I wanted to share my, you know, my experiences with the, the next generation of leaders coming up so we can change that from 70% engaged or from 30% engaged to 70% engaged. I really would like to see that change. And I think it all, it all comes down to leadership and, and leading people effectively is what's going to change the level of engagement and enthusiasm with employees. So I think, you know, it, it's a matter of trying to pass on, you know, things I've learned. Yeah. And your book is, is a series of, you know, quick, hard hitting, um, you know, the shorter essays, right? It's not a long book, a little over a hundred pages. Mm -hmm. And uh, you told me that you originally wrote these as a series of essays. Where, where were you publishing these initially? Were they kind of blog posts or, you know, for mm. your own employees or what, where, where did they come out of? Yeah, I started, I started writing a, basically a blog six years ago. So I have a leadership blog at, on my website that I started writing and I, and I did, I contributed to a number of different websites, wrote leadership articles. So these are all articles I've written over the past six years and sort of, you know, I've written on all sorts of diff different subjects, but this book specifically deals with um, the leading people and, 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 and dealing with the people side of business. So there's all sorts of sides to leadership, you know, there's strategy, there's vision, there's mission planning, and there, there, there's so much of the, uh, hard skills. This one's more of the, uh, th they call it soft skills, but in my opinion, uh, they seem to be hard for leaders to be able to do. So there are soft skills that are, it's common sense that's uncommonly applied, I guess, is a way I would describe what's in this book. It's the things that we sh probably should be doing, but we're 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 too busy sometimes as bosses to be able to 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 be able to do it. So all these are all these essays and articles were were ones that featured you know, the best ways to lead people uh, from a leadership perspective. Yeah, you have a chapter in here about doing something memorable or you know and celebrate mm -hmm. celebrating an employee. Tell us a little bit yeah. some of the ideas around around that around you know really showing someone that you care about them. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, first of all, I mean, it's not that hard to, um, to, to be, you know, to be an authentic leader, to spend time where your people are and to have a conversation with them and to have an authentic relationship with them. And so part of that is just celebrate, celebrating them and thanking them when, you know, when, the, when they're doing something, you know, I, I, the other day, I remember going out on the shop floor and my head of engineering was out there drilling parts. And, you know, I could have just walked by, but you know, I was curious, like, why are you drilling parts? And uh, and I talked to him and he says, you know, well, these all came out, came in wrong, but I figured I could modify them. We could still use them and stay in production. He didn't have to do that, but he he did it. And he did it because he cared about the company. He cared about our customers. And, you know, that's one of those things where, you know, I said you have to stop and you have to thank him and you have to really just really appreciate him as a person, as an employee for, you know, showing that initiative. So I think we miss out on those opportunities sometimes as leaders because we're sequestered in our office or in a conference room or on conference calls and we we don't get a chance to see our people face to face in action right and so we got to look for those opportunities to to see our employees kind of you know doing great things and we have to appreciate it we have to show that appreciation so but part of it is just having that uh being present and, uh, and, and, you know, keeping an eye out for the things that are going right. You know, we tend to always focus on the things that are going wrong as bosses, but we got to look for when, when employees are doing the right thing as well. Yeah. And so that celebration is, is important. And what are some of your ideas around making that celebration truly memorable? 
Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, treasured tokens, I, I would say this. If you walk around your office, wherever you're at, well, right now, probably everybody's at home. But if you can imagine when you were in the office, <laughs> um, if you walk around to look at people's desks, you see treasured tokens of their of their career, right? And uh, things that are on their desk that uh, that have meaning to them, right? They were part of some team or they were part of some uh, major achievement, right? They keep those like, uh, like, like, treasure like trophies of, of their of their life and their career so when i like to you know when we have big events or something that significant happens i do like to do something you know we we might have a big dinner or a big luncheon or what have you but then i'd like to give employees something and you know as an example we um my manufacturing business we celebrated our first year and and the first uh we had 10 employees they were the first 10 and they will never be you know uh, the, there will only be those 10 employees. They were the, they were the foundation of this business. And so we, I took um, rocks that uh, basically river rocks and we had carved into that, the company logo and, um, and just, and, and we, and basically, and it said, um, Oh, I'm sorry. It was first nine employees, not 10 for uh, <laughs> the fact we put the founding nine. So they were the founding nine employees of the company. And it was kind of neat because each rock was different right but each uh so it represented two things one is that um is that each employee was brought a unique gift to this business right they were as part of the early employees the first nine employees and um and they also built the foundation for the business so that was kind of a you know kind of a memorable thing and then that rock is just a rock but you you walk around the offices and those guys are really proud of that being part of that founding nine uh employees and it's something that will never we'll never give that out ever again. But it's something that, you know, is sort of a treasured token of of their history. You know, they'll, they'll look at that fondly. of Wow. Yeah, that was a tough time during those uh, during that first year when we had, you know, when we had nothing, we were trying to create things out of nothing. So. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. That reminds me from, yeah. from my Navy days. You probably saw the same thing where um, when they did a, an overhaul and, and did a big mm. hull cut that uh, yes. the folks that were involved in that, you know, they gave out plaques that had a little chunk of the hull on yes. uh, stuck to the plaque. And uh, I got on board just a little too late. I was jealous of those guys that had this stupid hunk of like whole metal. <laughs> it's like, whatever. That's, so that, yeah, so that's it. So that, so you just touched on it. What, you know, so, you know, if you give something like that, a, a token, you, it actually affects other employees as well. So the employee that gets the reward, they're like, wow, that's really nice. Thank you. You know, something I'll always remember, but then other ple- people see it too, and they want to be part of it. You know, for example, we, uh, in one company we were doing, you know, we were, we were training Six Sigma black belts and, and every black belt got this, um, I don't know how to describe it, but this, this little thing they would put on their desk, it just said they were Six Sigma black belt. And, you know, other people would say, well, I want one of those things too, you know, and they, they sort of see that and they want to say, well, I want to be a part of that as well. So when you, when you celebrate employees, when you, when you thank employees or reward employees, other people see it as well too. And they want to be a part of that as well. So, yeah. yeah. You have a chapter in here, which really resonated with me um, about leading experienced employees. Cause that's one of the toughest yeah. things as a junior division officer you get yeah. on board the ship and you're put in charge of reactor controls division or machinery <laughs> division. You got this chief who's been around for like 30 yeah. years and, yeah. uh, and you know, the, and even all, every enlisted guy in the division has more experience on board than you and you're expected to lead them. What were some yeah. of the key lessons learned about leading people that are more experienced than you are? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a great uh, thing that you touched on. Yeah. It's, it's really important. Um, so, how do you do it? So when you when you're in a situation where the people working for you, the senior enlisted, uh, the chief petty officer has got as many years in the Navy as you have on Earth. How do you deal with that? Right. And I think it comes right down to a few things. One is you have to listen. Right. You have to listen and observe. You can't uh, pretend that, you know, all the answers. So it, it takes so you've got to spend time, spend time with your with your experienced leaders. You have to listen to them. You have to you know, observe how they're acting, you know, the kind of questions they're asking, what, what's, what's, what's important, what's not important. So it's, it's having that respect for all of that experience, all of that knowledge and making sure that you tap into it and that you, 
you know, you listen and, and you and, and you take action on the things that, uh, you know, that, that, that you're hearing from them. But the other side of it is, is that you are in a unique position. You have been chosen that, as the leader, you know, whether or not you have experience or not. And there are some things that only the leader can do. So on, on the submarine, for example, you were the interface with, with, uh, you know, with the engineering, uh, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with, with the department head, right? So you, you were that inter- interface with, with upper management, if you will, or the higher uh, ranking officers. And so you, you were that interface so that, you, you know, your chief petty officer didn't go to the engineer, right? You went to the engineer, you had to, you had to get the permission or you had to get the approvals and what have you. So I think it's a matter of doing the things that only the leader can do, making sure that you do those things, but also having that respect and that, um, and and you know and and making sure that you're ta- you know talking to your key people and your experienced people and you learn from them. So I think if you, you know you've got to kind of balance those things out. But if you, the, the 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 guys that had the biggest trouble were the ones coming in saying that you know acting like they knew it all right and they had all the answers and that's just a recipe for disaster. So you've got to rely on your experienced people. You got to show them respect. You've got to defer to their experience. But then they're you've got to act as a leader. You have to do the things that only the leader can do. Yeah, my editorial comment on that is that the same principle applies for consultants when you're working with a client. Mm. I'll see a lot of people who want to get on the phone with a client and kind of tell them, okay, well, this is my approach, right? Mm. As opposed to, um, I think someone who is maybe even more confident um, and more comfortable will and maybe more vulnerable, we'll ask the client, well, hey, how do you, you know, what's your mental model for how this project should go? What, you know, what are you looking for? How, do, what do you think needs to get done? And just kind of put it mm. on them and not trying to be the person with all the answers, but, but to listen more uh, to what the clients have to say, you know, as opposed to trying to walk around like, oh, I know exactly what to do. I have all the mm. answers. So it's sort of the same principle. And I've tried to, you know, apply in my consulting work what uh, that, that experience from being a division officer and realizing I'm clueless compared to this master chief. Um, yes. Yes. No, it's really good. I, I can tell you when I, I first got my first manufacturing plant at 32 years old, um, I, I had employees that had been there 30 years and, you know, so I was fortunate that I had that experience as a young junior officer, uh, to be able to practice those skills because it, it came natural to me when I, when I, was in that situation in, in corporate life is that, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I learned, I didn't know, I didn't have the answers, but I do, I did have really good people who did know the answers. Right. It just made, you know, plugging into that knowledge base yeah. and doing it in a respectful way. So you've got another book coming out and talk to me a little bit about, you said, you know, before we started, you know, the, the show here, you told me that this, this book was a little bit of a, kind of a practice or of a warm up. Um, tell me about what it was like going from the essays that you had published to actually really pull it all together and make it a beautiful finished product that was, you know, ready to put put, you know, for sale. And how did you kind of what did you learn from that and and how did you actually mm-hmm. go about doing it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I've been working on a, a another book for about 2 years and that should should be out this year. Um, but as I was in the middle of working on that book, um, I made a decision to pivot and to put out something smaller uh, for a couple of reasons. One is um, I had never published a book before, so I needed to learn the entire process. But the other side of it is um, I wanted to get my name out there, right? So I wanted to have something that, um, that you know, people knew who I was and, and they had something they could, you know, kind of understand my leadership style from that first book before I came out with a second book. So I stopped what I was doing on the big book and I, and I pivoted towards putting out this smaller book. And, um, and, I, and, and again, this is something really important for maybe all of your listeners is, you know, I think it's really important for entrepreneurs and independent people is that you've got to repurpose, right? You've got to repurpose what you already have. And I had written so many article, uh, articles, hundreds of articles, and I said, you know, there's some that are really popular, some that have resonated a lot. Can I put that together? Can I can I build, um, 
you know, uh, one book that has a theme through it that maybe are different essays, different short stories, but have a, a general theme. And so that's what I did. I took sort of every article I'd written about sort of leading people, um, you know, the people centric kind of, uh, you know, leadership uh, essays I had written and I put, put that in a book and I sort of sort of planned how it would flow and what have you. But uh, yeah, it's just putting all the stuff I already had together. And then, of course, I connected with people that had written books before and learned a little bit about the process, about, you know, what do I need to do with regard to editing and typesetting and, uh, you know, all the fun stuff. And this is an independently published book, so it's published through uh, through Amazon and learning that whole process and, uh, you know, and doing an Audible book and all that fun stuff and, and the Kindle version. But um yeah, so I so I learned a lot through the whole process and met so many amazing people. Uh, especially, I I talked to a lot of veteran authors, people who are military veterans and published books, and got a lot of insight from a, a lot of different people before I put the book out. So, um, yeah, so it's a good experience. And you know, as an older, you know, as as, as fifty, I think it was fifty one when the book came out. So, um, you know, uh, it was like an old dog and new tricks, right? And that's and you know, anyone can do it at any age. Uh, you can learn this process. It's it's pretty straightforward. And I would say this is that it's never been an easier time to publish a book, right? The, it, the, the tools are there. Um, you know, you can learn them. Uh, you know, YouTube is a wonderful tool <laughs> to learn things. So. Yeah. So walk us through some of those tips. So you let's say that you, ha- you had all the essays, right? You, and you, mm-hmm. you selected from the hundreds that you'd published. Okay, here's my set. You put them in order. And then... Um, walk us through the very practical steps of what sort of other people did you get involved in the process, like a copy editor, someone to do all the formatting. It's a very nicely formatted book. Um, you know, so did you have someone to design your cover? Like what were the different people that you had to get? What were the steps to go from, I have a bunch of essays written to, okay, now I have a book on Amazon. What were the steps to get from A to B? Yeah. So um, in, in my case, I, um, uh, I did. I did talk to uh, a gentleman who does uh, business book coaching. Uh, he's he's actually a ghost author as well, but he also coaches business people towards writing non-fictional books. And um, so that that was uh, so he helped me coach me a little bit about um, you know he he's the one that helped me make a decision to, to pivot and put the smaller book out. So I would say getting some outside advice from somebody that might um, have some experience in, in publishing uh, is, is you probably want to have that conversation. And I think the the main things uh, he pointed me towards was having, you know, uh, a consolidated, you know, because uh, I had a lot of essays, but he was helping me focus in on consolidating around a certain theme. In our case, it was leading people. Um, but I think the other thing he helped me with was, you know, what do you have that's unique in the world? What are you that is unique from everybody else in the world? And he's like, you, he said, there are very few people who like you uh, have been a submariner and then led businesses, you know, uh, as long as you did, plus having your own business. He said, (laughs) he said, if you don't put a submarine on that cover, I'll be mad at you. And I'm like, well, it's not a book about submarines. He's like, yes, I know. But if you don't put a submarine on that cover, I'll be mad at you. But the point being is focus, a uh, cover design is really important. So you've got to get a good, you know, cover design artist, uh, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. I'm sorry. <laughs> we all judge books by their cover and the cover is really, really important. So I think, um, you know, getting the right cover, um, you know, that's going to be critical. So, so getting, getting some help in terms of, you know, focusing the book, focusing, um, what you're going to write. And there's a great resource, by the way. Um, it's called the uh, the Business Book Bible is the name of the uh, the book that I read. And um, I think it's what it's called. And uh, that is an excellent uh, resource uh, for how to write a book. Um, and um, yeah, here it is. It's called the Business Book Bible, Everything You Need to Know to Write a Great uh, business book. And that's written by Derek Lewis. And Derek actually was the guy, the gentleman I mentioned that, that kind of coached me through my first book. So uh, I would encourage anyone who's thinking about writing a book to read this book first, because it talks all about um, the kind of things you're asking me about, like, you know, how do you do typesetting, cover design, uh, fonts. Um, 
things like he talks about uh, the the white ladder uh, or or the white waterfall, and uh, that's when you're looking at final print. You 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 have you know it has to look good. So when you start see these gaps in your in your print, it's actually distracting. So you've got to make sure that if you have a good typesetter, they'll they'll know to eliminate those white ladders and those white waterfalls. So it's um there, there's sort of a little bit of an art to typesetting and printing that I didn't know about. And um, if you you got to get a good typesetter, you got to get a good cover designer. You have to have an editor. Um, for example, I have uh, I was put in touch with a, an editor that was a retired school teacher. She's amazing. And she she found things I wouldn't even thought of, you know, commas and, you know, tenses and verbs and, you know, things like that. So we tend to as professionals, right, we're we know our craft, but writing in English is always a challenge. I'm an engineer, right? So <laughs> writing is always a challenge. And so she found things that I wouldn't have seen myself. So making sure you have a good, you know, a number set of eyes on it. The other side of it is get some good reviews that you can, you know, um, you know, so reach out to a number of people, get as many, you know, uh, blurbs, if you will. So reviews that you can put in the book itself. That's really important to have on the cover and the inside cover, just people who have reviewed the book and looked at the book. So um, I tried to get it out to do as many CEOs that I knew that they could review it and give me feedback before we publish it. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of steps, but that, that, uh, the business book Bible, I would highly encourage people to look at if they're thinking about writing a book. Fantastic. Great tips. Um, what, uh, you know, it sounds like you're pretty, you know, you love, uh, running, uh, your, your, your firm peak demand. What, what, um, how do you see the, your ongoing writing? You have a new book, like you mentioned, a larger one coming out. Um, are you planning to kind of have a, a second, you know, side career doing some some <laughs> consulting or speaking or teaching? Um, tell us about that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's like a side hustle on my main hustle, I guess. Um, yeah. So my main thing is I started, uh, like I said, a manufacturing business. That's my that takes up, uh, you know, whatever the 60 hours a week. And then, then my free time. I do, uh, you know, I'm writing this book. I'm, um, I do a podcast uh, that I do a leadership podcast called Deep Leadership, uh, where I interview, you know, entrepreneurs, leaders uh, about, you know, how, what makes a great leader. And it's been been a lot of fun to meet people through that. And um, I've been speaking a lot. I speak to um, gra mostly grad school, uh, usually MBA or um, or like engineering uh, management or master's in engineering programs. So I've been talking leadership to, to uh, you know, mostly regionally uh, here. And then I also talk to local business leaders about leadership issues. So, um, for example, I just put on a series of webinars on how to lead through a crisis. So we've been presenting that to a few different groups of uh, business leaders here in North Carolina. Um, so yeah, so no, it's it's more it's more for fun. Um, it's I've really enjoyed it, enjoyed sharing my sharing my experience and helping others. And um, you know, I've done I help a lot of young leaders, um, mostly veterans transitioning out of the military. <clears throat> I try to help them get it, get their career started with advice and you know things things to do to kind of get get in you know get get their careers going into the civilian world. So I've been trying to help there, but it's mostly for fun, mostly. Uh, I'm trying to help, trying to share my experiences. Yeah. And, and have you found that, you know, sort of the um, the surface, you know, kind of goal may be to be sharing insights, but have you found that as you sit down to write these that you're actually, you know, uh, gaining new insights yourself and discovering things through the process of, of putting it on paper? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, you can't, you know, it's funny, you, you know, as, as a, as a leader, I want to be as authentic as I can. And I find myself, um, you know, as I do research and uncovering things that I'm, you know, I realize that I'm not doing that well in my own personal leadership style. So, so I, yeah, I'm actually find that I'm getting better as a leader, as I write about leadership and talk about leadership and interview people who are amazing leaders. And uh, I'm always like, wow, you know, I've really got to step up my game here. Right. So, so yeah, I thank you. You continue to develop. A, you know, it's funny. When I was a young leader, I felt like, at least when I first um, was leading in the civilian world, I felt felt like I had, you know, I had all the answers, or I had to have all the answers. And I think now, what I've learned over the years is that 
really, I don't have the answers, but, but my people do, my teams do. And it's just being able to tap into that collective wisdom of the team and being, being able to uncover that and uh, let them have a voice. And, and uh, as I've been able to do that, I, I find that the business has performed so much better when you let people uh, have a voice and have the authority to do the job. Right. And, and that's been the biggest development for me over the years is, you know, kind of letting go a little bit and let others uh, take control of things. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to your upcoming book, which which you told me is uh, full of leadership lessons from your Navy days and from your submarine days. Look forward to that. Yes. Where can people go online to find out more about you, to follow you? If you want to give a website or your Twitter handle, where, where, where can people find out sure. more about John Rennie? Sure. My my main website is johnsrennie.com, and it's John without an H. But if you put an H in, it works. So johnsrennie.com, and uh, my Twitter handle is johnsrennie, and I do talk a lot about uh, leadership there. Um, if you're interested in the book, it's called I Have the Watch, and if you go to iofthewatch.com, you can uh, get access to the book and all that information. And I run a podcast, as I mentioned, and it's uh, deepleadershippodcast.com. You can get all that information. But yeah, uh, all my links are on my webpage at johnsrennie.com. Well, John, thank you so much for joining, for sharing some leadership lessons and, and the, the great work that you're doing at, at Peak Demand to keep people safe. It's been great having you on the show. Will, I really appreciate it.